So I, I'm really pleased that we all seem to agree that we're facing interacting global challenges of broken food systems, uh, is it? broken food systems, uh, biodiversity loss, climate change, um, and widespread land and water degradation. And let us be clear that the impacts of these are very unequally distributed. And we also have known for quite a long time that people are not hungry because there's not enough food, but because uh, uh, they can't access it. So the fact that these interactions are of critical importance, the science is getting stronger. Uh, this is a paper from Charlie Althwaite um, in Nature this year that shows it's the interaction between uh, climate change and agricultural intensification that is driving reduction in insect uh, abundance by about 50% and diversity by about 27%. So it's these things acting together that make the difference. This is not changing. Ah, good. And that means that we need to look at our SDGs, not singly, but together. So if we start looking at, for example, here, two SDG targets, uh, prevalence of undernourishment, and proportion of land that is degraded, we can begin to see relationships between these things. And it's no good if we're getting better nourishment at the expense of land degradation. That's clearly not going to be sustainable. So if we map these challenges and the Rio conventions and uh, um, FAO and, and, and CFS and, and uh, the, the UNFSS that, that are um, individually looking at each of these key uh, challenges, our better environment, uh, our better nutrition and, and better production are really focusing around uh, combinations of those. But better lives, and I'm deliberately as he's <laughs> using it in the plural, because people's livelihoods are inc incredibly heterogeneous and the inequalities that uh, exist in relation to uh, these impacts uh, are important. Now, the issue is improving livelihoods without further damaging the planet. And Kate Raworth has a, a framework for looking at this, where in the inner part of the circle, we're dealing with meeting uh, the thresholds for well-being, but without overshooting planetary boundaries. And if we look at countries in relation to the extent to which they are transgressing uh, boundaries or um, meeting thresholds, then all countries are developing countries because none are in that sweet spot where they're meeting well-being uh, targets while uh, not transgressing penalty boundaries. Now, the high-level panel of experts of the Committee on World Food Security um, recently, 2019, produced a report on agroecological and other uh, innovative approaches to um, sustainable agriculture for food security and nutrition, and articulated 13 agroecological principles covering the whole food system. So that's um, the socioeconomic governance uh, uh, context, right down to the agro ecosystem management, with co-creation of knowledge with stakeholders, empowering um, farmers, fishers, and so on uh, in the process. And there is again increasing evidence, paper in Nature Sustainability just a few weeks ago, showing from a huge amount of data, 30 trials, um, each at least nine years, uh, showing that we can, uh, as we increase diversification of crops, we get um, uh, uh, high yields. And with uh, legumes, we can substitute for inorganic nitrogen. And that's really important because what type of technology do we need in order to fix nitrogen for agriculture? Given the modern uh, world that we have, are we wanting to go for a centralized production of very labile nitrogen that you've got to distribute, that farmers have to buy, that has risks and costs? 
Or do you want millions of farmers having their own factory for nitrogen production in their fields um, where they are uh, able to own and to manage that production themselves? The problem is, it's very simple to go for a bag of nitrogen, put it on and get a miraculous um, um, impact immediately, even if a lot of it leaks. It's much more difficult, it's complex, knowledge intensive, and it requires a complete system change away from monocultures um, that are fed by environmentally disruptive chemicals to support local innovation. And that requires a complete reconfiguration of our research, education and extension system to empower the farmer to take local knowledge seriously and to support local innovation. That is transformative change. A lot of the time we talk about transformation, but we're not really challenging the status quo. Recent evidence reviews show that agroecological practices on the whole improve food security and nutrition, 78% of the time um, in a global review. And the more uh, complex, the, the, the more different practices that are employed at the same time, the greater the benefit. But let's be clear, there are very different transition pathways depending on where you start and where you're heading to. The Gleesman transition that a lot of people are very familiar with starts from industrial agriculture and uh, reducing inputs. In a much of um, um, sub-Saharan Africa or parts of uh, Asia, we're actually needing to start from uh, an agroecological intensification pathway um, and intensifying without damaging the environment. Now, one of the outcomes of uh, UNFSS was the Agroecology Coalition. It has six uh, uh, Asian countries uh, as members out of a total of nearly 40, including three commissions and um, uh, about uh, 80 organizations. So it's really uh, taking ahead of steam and it's a coalition of the willing. And that's really important because what often happens is that things get watered down. If you look at the recommendations of the HLP report, they were incredibly watered down by the time that it came to the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, policy convergence process because uh, everybody had to agree. There are examples from Asia, these are from Vietnam, on very clear benefits from uh, agroecological uh, intensification involving a mixture of different practices. And I want to finish with highlighting Michael Fakri, the, the uh, rapporteur on the right to food, who's uh, presenting uh, his report on the 28th of this month to the UN General Assembly, where he recommends a just transition to agroecology to provide a way forward to dealing with building back better from COVID. Uh, Fergus, can you take up the uh, nitrogen uh, question, please? Yeah, and I want to do that by, by also commenting on the, the digital sure, question. Please. Uh, um, and I, I think it's very interesting because we're sort of assuming that the farmer is just a recipient of knowledge and decision advice. But actually, if we're really being transformative in the types of technology that we um, uh, are looking at and using natural processes more rather than forcing agricultural systems um, with um, uh, environmentally disruptive chemicals, then you have a much more heterogeneous context because you're not making the environment uniform in the first place. You've got a lot more species involved because you've got multiple cropping. Um, you're you're uh, going to have to deal with a whole load of uh, different soil types and your aim is long-term soil health as well as immediate uh, soil fertility. Now, in, in that context, you're trying to support local innovation. You're not going to have all that information in a decision support. Sure, there's lots of uh, things that you can offer the farmer, but also there's a need to be collecting information from farmers about what works where and for whom. And this is what we call the options by context paradigm. So in, we've moved completely away from silver bullets now, and you're embedding research in the scaling up process of development, and you're collecting from using 
the latest developments in ICT to empower farmers to be trying things out and to be sharing the information that they get uh, in terms of performance. And of course, the critical thing, and that comes to the second question about, you know, what, why uh, um, um, did we move away from legumes and, and towards uh, monocles? Well, of course, market forces were pushing things in that direction. We still have a lot of market failures, and we've, we've heard about that in relation to subsidizing fertilizer. That distorts the decisions that, um, uh, that people make. And if you give people free fertilizers, rather than cash, that they could then either use to buy fertilizer or to invest in some other aspect of their um, agricultural system, then we might end up with very different decisions. So what we have at the moment is certainly not optimal in relation to the global challenges that we're now facing. We need, and, and, and this is what is meant by transformation. I think too much of the time we're being too timid and we're looking at, oh, can we use the fertilizer a little bit more efficiently? Yeah, rather than is that model of chucking a lot of um, um, nitrogen fertilizer, certainly, and let's be very clear, other nutrients are more, <laughs> are more difficult because we don't have that biological fixation process. And the other thing that you can see here is that all of these things are connected. The production technology affects the equity, it affects the, the ownership, it, 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 it's very much um, um, all connected. We can't one minute be thinking about rights, the next minute thinking about one technology or another. And I think that's one of the real problems that we face is that the people who are doing the innovation in relation to technology are disconnected from the people who are thinking about equity and rights and, and so on. But actually, these things are so intimately connected that we need that transdisciplinary type of approach where you're working together with the stakeholders to support their local innovation so you have general principles, but when you apply them locally, you end up with a diversity of practice.